I'm forewarned meteorologist Kim Adams. Look at this gorgeous shot of downtown Detroit. Beautiful blue skies, temperatures in the 60s, and it gets even warmer than this. I'll have your forecast in minutes. All right, Kim, also first at four, an alleged member of the controversial Boogaloo Boys facing charges in Detroit. We have the very latest information from his court appearance, and here's Kim DiGiulio. A local nonprofit from Macomb County is asking for helpers from anywhere in Michigan. I'll explain how volunteering for this organization could be a life-changing opportunity. Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News First at 4 starts now. Good afternoon, I'm Karen Drew, a Michigan member of the Boogaloo Boys with a criminal past is now facing federal charges. Timothy Teagan is accused of lying about drug use while purchasing a gun. FBI agents arrested the 24-year-old after raiding his father's Plymouth home. Now, during that raid, agents confiscated marijuana and at least two guns. Teagan has a documented history promoting the Boogaloo movement, including a rally at the state capitol building last January. Coming up at 5, an in-depth look at that criminal complaint against Teagan. Also, a one-on-one -on -one with his father about Teagan's past involvement with extremist groups. Oakland County Sheriff's deputies are looking for a hit-and-run driver this afternoon after a terrifying chain of events unfolded on M59. It happened over the weekend near Adams Road. The accident left one woman dead. Her boyfriend is facing charges, but investigators still need to find the driver of another vehicle. Deputies say three people were riding in a car on M59 in Rochester Hills. It was very early Saturday morning. They say 41-year-old Kyle Rasmussen tried to grab the steering wheel and choke the driver. Rasmussen is now facing assault charges. Sadly, his 30-year-old girlfriend tried to run from the vehicle, was hit by another car, and then died from her injuries. Deputies are now looking for an Audi Q7 SUV. The color is unknown, but it should have some front-end damage. So if you did see anything Saturday morning or perhaps can help find that Audi, please call Crime Stoppers. The number is 1-800-SPEAK-UP. Nearly 2 million Michigan voters have requested absentee ballots this year, so if you haven't sent yours back by now, do not put that ballot in the mail. Secretary of State says it is too late and you should actually hand deliver those ballots to your local clerk's office or a secure local drop box. All ballots must be received by 8 p.m. on Election Day or they will not be counted, so don't let your vote get stuck in the mail. And don't forget, we have a digital election guide right now at ClickOnDetroit.com. It includes exclusive poll results on key races and proposals. Plus, Devin Skillian is interviewing Governor Whitmer and Republican Tudor Dixon about those key issues you care about. Our election guide has a complete guide to what's on the ballot and a call to for help to find out exactly where you need to vote. It's all on the elections page. Well, if we had a vote on today's weather, there's no question. We'd have a winner. It's looking really nice outside. Forewarned meteorologist Kim Adams standing by with the first forecast. Kim? Well, Karen, it's not unusual that we get a nice, sunny, pretty 60-degree day in October and November, but what is rare is that we get a string of them like we've had. And the weather just continues to get better through the rest of the week. 68 at Metro Airport, 67 City Airport, 66 in Pontiac. It's just about a degree or two cooler than it was yesterday, but tomorrow and into Friday, it's going to get even warmer. Clouds and radar, nothing going on. There's some clouds down to our south in parts of Ohio, but we are under a ridge of high pressure that brings us beautiful weather this evening. Sunsets tonight uh, just before 630. 56 degrees at 8 o'clock will be down to 50 by midnight. We do expect patchy fog over overnight tonight. Now there is a slight change to the timing of the rain for the weekend. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. All right. Thank you, Kim. Well, we told you it was coming and the Federal Reserve just made it official just a short time ago. The Fed is bumping up its benchmark interest rate by three quarters of a point. Now that move raises the short term rate to the highest level in 15 years. It's the central bank's sixth rate hike this year. We do know that decision has ripple effects of things like credit cards, new auto loans and new mortgages. Now, one possible bright spot, the Fed hinted future rate hikes could be smaller. We know investors watch these decisions oh so closely. At first, stocks went up, but that has changed after the Fed chairman indicated it is too early to pause rate increases. Markets started then to fall as the markets closed at down 504 points. As you've been hearing all year, the Fed is raising interest rates, trying to get that inflation under control, but trying to also avoid a recession.
We've got breaking news in the sentencing of convicted school shooter Nicholas Cruz. His sentencing continues at this hour with more victims and families who lost loved ones unleashing their grief, their anger and their frustration in his direction. Kimberly Gill in the newsroom this afternoon tracking another emotional day in court. Yes, hi Karen. Good afternoon. It's been two days of devastating victim impact statements. Cruz confessed to killing 17 people inside Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Many of the victims relatives have been telling him exactly how they feel about his crimes as well as their losses. Last month, a jury spared Cruz from the death penalty instead recommending life without parole. The judge is bound by that recommendation, but victims and their families are still allowed to offer impact statements in open court. Several people chose to have their say, even though it won't have any say on the ultimate decision. Many of them got very personal, speaking directly to Cruz, like this woman who lost her daughter in the mass shooting. My hope is for you is that you are miserable for the rest of your pathetic life. My hope for you is that the pain of what you did to my family burns and traumatizes you every day. Really, really emotional uh, victim impact statements there. Uh, right at the top of the hour, the hearing reconvened. They had been in recess for a few hours, and it appears that more victim impact statements are happening right now, including uh, right now uh, a sister of the victim is one of the victims is speaking, uh, saying, quote, after today, the killer will cease to exist for her. So, Karen, a lot more to come on this. We'll continue to monitor it for you and have an update on later editions of Local 4 News. Until then, we'll send it back to you. Obviously a dramatic day. Yeah, court. it really was. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. Mm -hmm. Two of the country's biggest drug stores have reached some settlements in the legal battle over opioids. CVS Health and Walgreens announced agreements in principle to pay $5 billion each. An attorney says Walmart is also in discussions for a deal. Together, the settlements could be the last round of big deals to end litigation linked to the industry's role in the overdose epidemic. Most of the money would be used to fight the opioid crisis. Neither CVS nor Walgreens is admitting wrongdoing. The battle against narcotics playing out in communities all across Metro Detroit. One organization is looking for new recruits. Our Kim DiGiulio spoke to one volunteer who describes what it feels like to help those fighting drug addiction. This Macomb County based nonprofit known as Families Against Narcotics is determined to help those who are struggling with addiction get better. However, in order to get those people the help that they need, they need your help. Families Against Narcotics launched a program called Hope Not Handcuffs in 2017, giving people with substance use disorders a safe place to surrender. Executive Director Linda Davis says they partnered with more than 130 police stations around the state. But at that moment when that person comes to the police station, that's when they need to be greeted by a Hope Not Handcuffs volunteer, which the organization is in need of statewide. Lisa Bosca was a volunteer for two years. You know, at first it was a little bit intimidating, a little scary. Um, I wasn't sure what I was walking into, but when I went on that first call, and I'll never forget it, um, it gave me a sense of completion, and it gave me a sense of peace knowing that I was there for somebody that was hurting, and I was able to get them the resources to get them into treatment. She says at any moment you could receive a text message with the location of where a volunteer is needed. If you're available, it takes about an hour to be the liaison between the person struggling with addiction and the treatment center. You're getting them off that street and to start their road into recovery and that is like the best feeling in the whole entire world. That's why they call the Hope Not Handcuffs volunteers angels. Not only are you helping them, but you're kind of helping yourself too, knowing that you're just, you're that warm heart telling them, look, we care about you. Again, they need volunteers all over the state of Michigan. For information on how you can become an angel, there's information on the Families Against Narcotics website as well as the Hope Not Handcuffs website, which are both listed on our website, click on Detroit.com. In Clinton Township, I'm Kim DeGiulio, Local 4. We appreciate it, Kim. Thank you. By the way, Hope Not Handcuffs once had around 800 volunteers, but once the pandemic hit, they've really had trouble getting them back.